European School of Oncology. E-session will start soon. Please hold on. School of Oncology, e-session will start at 6.15 p.m., Central European Time, please hold on. School of Oncology, e-session will start soon, please hold on. European School of Oncology, e-session will start at 6.15 p.m., Central European Time, please hold on.
School of Oncology. E-session will start soon. Please hold on. Good morning, afternoon and evening. This is the conference operator. The European School of Oncology welcomes you to the E-Session 536,000. Today's session is Children and Young People with Cancer in UK and COVID-19. Please note that CME application for today's session is still in progress. Participants will be notified when the CME test and certificate becomes available. As a reminder, during the live session, all participants can ask questions live at any time by simply pressing on the relevant button at the bottom of the page. Questions will be received by Dr. Wendy McInally, of the Edinburgh Napier University, Edinburgh, United Kingdom, who will discuss them with Dr. Laura Healy, the Alder Hay Children's Hospital, Liverpool, United Kingdom. Here is an extract of the policy which is published on our website in full. I will now hand over to Dr. Healy. Doctor, your line is now open. Hi, I'm Laura Healy and I'm a practice educator for the Oncology Haematology Unit in Alderhey Children's Hospital. And I'm here today to talk about COVID-19 and its impact upon children and young people with cancer. So the aims of today is to talk about how COVID-19 has impacted upon this patient demographic medically, how it's impacted upon the patient, the parents and the family, both in hospital and the home environment, um, the psychosocial impact upon the patient and the family, my local experience within Alderhey Children's Hospital in the United Kingdom, and how we can support and engage with patients, parents and family members during this difficult time and going forward in the future. So COVID-19 was first discovered in Wuhan, China back in December 2019 amongst a population of patients who had pneumonia. And it was identified by the World Health Organization as a novel coronavirus. 
This spread rapidly between human to human contact and very quickly became a global pandemic. Symptoms of COVID-19 are high temperature, a dry and persistent cough, nausea, diarrhea, vomiting and anosmia. It was first thought that the elderly and immunocompromised patients were much more susceptible to COVID-19 and would catch it more quickly and become much more sicker. This was obviously of grave concern to the paediatric oncology community as children with cancer receiving chemotherapy for cancer makes them very immunocompromised and vulnerable to infection. However, our first fears and anxieties um, were not as severe as what we originally thought. And the Children's Cancer and Leukemia Group developed the UK Paediatric Oncology Coronavirus Cancer Monitoring Project. And this looked at children with cancer up and around the UK. It was found that only 3% of children with cancer were positive for COVID-19. And of this patient population, they range from mild symptoms to being completely asymptomatic and having no symptoms at all. This was fantastic news for our patients as this meant that this virus didn't affect our patients as much as we originally anticipated. The outcome for this patient's demographic was that they were all discharged home and none of them were acutely unwell or died of coronavirus. So the CCLG decided the children with cancer were at no further risk of developing COVID-19 or becoming acutely unwell or having severe health problems due to COVID-19. However, it did have a great impact upon services. It meant that there was a reduced workforce out on the front line. Staff members were either um, self-isolating because they had symptoms themselves or patients within that family household were self-isolating because they had symptoms. There's also a lot of people on the front line that were shielding because of underlying health conditions. And we anticipated at a hospital that we would lose 20% of capacity of our staff. So we prepared for that reduced workforce. What happens was that we upskilled a lot of members of staff in the hospital to ensure that they could look after critical care patients and support ventilator patients ready for a surge of coronavirus. We also redeployed staff into different areas. So we pulled nurse specialists into frontline roles and we trained staff in the community to come and work in the hospital environment. And that created a lot of fear and anxiety among staff. Not only were they scared coming into hospital that they might catch COVID-19 themselves and take it home to their family members, but they were also working in unfamiliar environments and caring for patients that they weren't normally used to. It also had an impact upon our radiology service and our surgery service. So all non-urgent surgery was cancelled and that did a multitude of things. It released beds in the surgical um, wards and also released surgical staff to support for a surge of patients. And it also released anaesthetic staff and ventilatory support ready for if we needed to expand our intensive care department ready for ventilated COVID patients. It also meant that we did less radiology. So children with cancer quite often get scanned as part of their treatment and end of treatment to assess their tumour. And this wasn't happened as frequently. As you can imagine, this caused a lot of fear and anxiety for parents and for patients that they weren't sure where their child was in relation to their treatment. However, because less scans were being performed in the hospital, there was an increased radiology report and speed, which was good for the medical division of the trust. There was also an impact upon radiotherapy and proton therapy services. So children with cancer who were requiring proton therapy currently go to the Christie's in Manchester, and they also go to America and to Germany. Due to government restrictions, these patients were no longer able to travel abroad, so that put a greater impact upon the Christie's hospital. That meant that there was a greater need for anaesthetic support and ventilatory support, because quite often children need um, anaesthetizing for proton therapy and radiotherapy. So a standard operating procedure was developed to ensure that all patients still received the right care. And that was streamlined for proton therapy to run alongside radiotherapy. So some children received conventional radiotherapy as opposed to proton, but they all still received the best possible treatment. Um, do you have any questions at this time? Yes, Laura, I have one. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering, how did you ensure that children's nurses were upskilled um, to be able to care for the adult patients with COVID? OK, so within Alder Hay Children's Hospital, we opened a COVID positive ward for, to take ventilator patients to relieve pressure on adult services. And certainly Rachel and Lindsay, who work within our critical care department, did a fantastic job of putting together a education package to upskill staff who some already had a bit of critical care experience and have moved into other areas within the hospital, or they were dual trained, so they'd done paediatric and adult nurse training. So they went on an intensive course um, where they upskilled them to use all the up-to-date equipment um, and care for, for adults within the adult intensive care ward. Thank you. 
-hmm. and they did a fantastic job and it worked really well. Mm -hmm. And did you find that you had any newly diagnosed um, children with cancer during this time? Yeah, we did have quite a few newly diagnosed um, children with cancer. And I think it was a more anxious time for them because there were so many changes within the hospital during that time that I'm going to discuss a little bit later on. Um, but obviously it was fearful for them coming in, not only having that cancer diagnosis, but also being scared of coming into hospital and being exposed to COVID. Yeah. OK, thank you. OK. There was also lots of changes in practice. So the Children's Cancer and Leukaemia Group, the CCLG, have been a constant source of advice for healthcare professionals and for patients and family with cancer. And as guidance has changed along with the World Health Organization, Public Health England and the NHS, the CCLG has been in constant communication with oncology consultants to ensure that we still provide the best care that we can for our patients and that services have had minimal impact due to COVID. We've also changed our support of care. So we've been providing much more care out in the community. So children are able to still stay in the home environment, stay safe, not come into hospital and the least exposure to COVID as possible. However, it's also had an impact upon toxicity testing. So children are having less cardiac echoes, less GFRs to check their renal function. So we need to think about how that's gonna impact upon the children throughout their treatment and also post-treatment for their late effects. So that's something as an oncology community, we really need to consider and look at and plan for the future. And we've also empowered parents. So we've empowered parents to deliver care out in the community to the child in the home environment. And that involves a multitude of things, such as administering chemotherapy, doing line flushes, giving supportive care. But obviously, we've had to do that on a case by case basis and do risk assessments to ensure that actually that parent or family member is equipped to provide that care and it's safe to do so within the home environment, as unfortunately, it's not suitable for every, every family member. We've also developed new ways of working. So we've developed virtual consultations, which has been fantastic. Um, Alder Hay Children's Hospital is a principal treatment centre and we provide care across North Wales, Merseyside and Cheshire. So some of our patients and families can travel up to two and a half hours for a single clinic appointment, which is very demanding upon their time and also demanding financially. So to be able to do a virtual consultation to speak to them in the home environment is a fantastic leap forward um, for the NHS and the way that we can support our patients. However, again, this isn't going to be suitable for everybody. If patients and families don't have computer at home um, or they haven't got adequate Wi-Fi, dependent on where they live or if they can afford Wi-Fi. We've also um, done online MCTs and meetings. Um, this has been a great way of engaging within staff within the multidisciplinary team, um, in particular for staff who work in other hospitals further afield. Again, it's reduced travel and reduced, reduced financial costs. And it's also enabled members of the MDT who haven't necessarily been able to join before have been able to join into these meetings, which has been a fantastic new way of working. We've also been triaging our patients differently over the telephone. So we're speaking to our patients on the telephone before they come into hospital to check how they are. Are they well? Do they have any symptoms of COVID? And are they safe to come into the hospital environment? And that's also enabled social distancing because it ensures that we don't have too many patients on the wards at once. And again, it's making sure that we maintain our patient safety, safety for our visitors and safety ultimately for our staff. And we've also been delivering more care in the community with parents cooperation. Not all parents want to have care in the community. Some of them do like that safety blanket of coming into hospital and seeing a healthcare professional. So it's constantly working with families, with the challenges that come forward, the demands that we face and the ever-changing face of COVID and um, how we can support them as much as we possibly can. It's had a massive impact upon patients within the hospital. Um, hospital staff wearing personal protective equipment has been a massive change for them. It can be quite daunting for a child being in the hospital environment anyway. So working in children's hospital, we try and make it as friendly as we possibly can. However, it is quite daunting for a child when you've got a visor, goggles, a face mask on, and they can't physically see your face or your facial expressions. So that can be more difficult to engage in conversations, to build up a good relationship with the child um, and get that rapport between the child and the family. And PPE has been constantly changing. So as Public Health England guidance changes, so does the PPE that we wear. And that faces challenges in itself because not only does it confuse staff because it's conflicting information from time to time, but it also confuses our patients and our families because ultimately they want to be as safe as possible and they want to know that we're protecting them. So that can be quite a challenge when you're explaining them changes to patients. 
They're also not seeing the same members of the MDT. Some members of the MDT aren't as visible because they're working at home, either due to shielding or to enforce social distancing within the hospital environment. So patients aren't seeing as many healthcare professionals on a day to day basis as what they normally would. And that reduces opportunities for patients to um, gain a rapport with the member of the MDT, build that work and relationship. And you also miss out on them little conversations that you have with the children when you're walking through the wards and you're passing the cubicle and you bump into someone that you haven't seen for a while. That's all been taken away, which is a shame because you get quite a lot of information out of them little conversations that you weren't expecting on that day. Impact on visiting has been enormous. Normally the children's wards are very busy, very vibrant and got lots of people about. However, now a child can only bring one parent in to visit. They can't have siblings come in to visit, extended family or friends. And for a child, that can be quite, um, quite damaging, especially if you've got a child where mum and dad don't necessarily get on and they're trying to choose between who comes for that chemotherapy admission. Do I pick my mum or do I pick my dad? Am I going to upset my mum or dad if I choose the other? So that's quite a big burden to put onto a child. And the hospital environment in itself is very different. Alder Hay Children's Hospital is a very friendly place to work and I'm very fortunate to work there. And it's a very vibrant place. And um, there's normally lots of activities going on in the hospital, music playing, people singing, magicians. And again, that's all being taken away from the children. So the hospital is a very different place to come and visit. And it's much more daunting and much more scary than the usually friendly environment that, that they're used to coming to see. And it's also got an impact upon patients at home. Shielding has been a massive issue. Um, when a child's diagnosed with cancer, um, it's quite a scary thing and they know that they've got a large journey ahead of them. And we encourage them to live as normal life as possible. We want them to see their friends. We want them to see their extended family. We want them to upkeep their physical activity and go to school and socialise. Now, due to shielding, this is no longer possible. So they've gone from having that bit of freedom to now not being able to go out at all. And that poses lots of challenges for our children. And they have seen, well, we've seen the psychosocial impact that that has upon them. There's also lack of education. So again, a child with cancer will spend a lot of time not being able to go to school, either due to treatments or if they're in hospital because they're generally unwell as side effects of treatments. And we encourage them to go to school as much as they possibly can and nursery also. However, now because schools are closed, unless it's a key worker child and due to shielding, um, these children are no longer able to go to school anymore. And it's not only missing out upon that education, but it's also missing out on them vital socialisation skills that children develop um, throughout their school life. And then lack of peer support. So peer support is vital for children and young people while they're going through their cancer journey. Peer support is vital in supporting them um, to get through their treatments and day-to-day -day life. And I'm going to talk more about peer support later on when I talk about our youth coordinator and how we've been supporting our teenagers out in the community. And it's a change to their new normality. Children with cancer, them and their families, their life is turned upside down and up on its head and back around again. It's like a whirlwind. However, they make their own normal and they make their life as normal as they possibly can. And that's all completely changed now due to COVID and the restrictions that are in place. It's also had a massive impact upon parents and families. Shielding, again, is a massive issue. Um, every family dynamic is completely different. Um, and they manage in different ways. So shielding's impacted upon every different family in an individual way. There's also been lots of conflict, conflicting information from government advice, dependent upon when the child lives in England or in Wales. And Alder Hay covers North Wales as well as areas of England. And that caused quite a lot of um, issues in between different families because of conflicting information. And they don't quite understand why one family is getting different information to another. We have had some families who have also received shielding letters from their GPs. That are 10, 15, 20 years off treatment. So have they followed that shield and advice when they haven't needed to, or actually have they contacted a healthcare professional to reassure them that that was miscommunication and actually they can continue life as normal as possible? It's also got big financial implications for families. If parents can't go to work because of COVID, because they're caring for their shields and child at home, are they supported by their employer? Are they still going to get a wage? Or is that income taken away from them? The stress and strain of a cancer diagnosis is a struggle enough without having to worry about finances. Not wanting to come into hospital. So hospital, they normally see as a safe place. They come in for treatment. They come in to get better. Um, and now they're not wanting to come in in case they come into contact with COVID and they catch a virus that makes them unwell. So that's an added stress and drain that that family doesn't need. 
They're also less likely to contact hospitals. They're seeing on the news how under pressure the NHS is and how much pressure we have on our services. So they're thinking if we don't contact the hospital, then it's less pressure for them. And it's important that we get that message out there to parents and families that we're still open for business and we're still here to give them as much advice as they possibly need. So that psychological impact is enormous. Um, that psychological impact is being seen currently by our psychologists, our youth support coordinators, our support staff that are trying to support our patients and families as much as they possibly can out in the community. Um, have you got any questions at this time? No, Laura, there's no questions um, from any of the participants yet, but I've got another one that I would like to ask. Um, do you feel that the your, yourself and your other colleagues felt safe, you know, with your PPE um, changing quite a lot, you know, until you actually felt, well, this is the right equipment you've got? Um, no, there was there was lots of challenges from um, staff out on the wards, um, mainly due to fear, because at the start of COVID, we treated it as a high consequence infectious disease. So the PPE was equivalent as to what they were using for the Ebola outbreak um, mm. over in Sierra Leone. So we trained our staff to a certain level and then Public Health England changed it and set that PPE down. So that caused a lot of anxiety among staff, um, mainly due to media and on the news where it was saying that we didn't have enough PPE, PPE was running out. So it was challenging trying to teach staff different ways of working when the kickback was, oh, well, you're only changing it because there's not enough, I've seen it on the news. So it was challenging to get over them barriers and um, to reassure staff that this was Public Health England guidance and we were following the right PPE and that they were protected and that they were safe. So that's been a constant battle as PPE has changed from start to now, and I'm sure that will continue in the future as well. Yeah, yeah. And it was an interesting discussion that you, when you talked about the inconsistencies, you know, from England to Wales, yeah. um, because we found that in Scotland here as well, yeah. that just the inconsistencies across the four nations. So thank you for highlighting that. That's okay. Um, the bell ring. So the ringing of the bell signifies end of treatment for patients and it shows that they have finished their cancer journey and they've survived cancer and that they've got through their treatment and got to the end. Um, this is something that patients and families really look forward to from diagnosis and they watch many other patients ring the bell throughout their treatment. Um, and it's a joyous thing to be part of and it's absolutely fantastic thing to watch. Um, and I've been lucky to watch many bell rings while I've been working on oncology. Um, it's a very vibrant event. Um, they have presents, they throw a party, they have friends, family, um, members of the MDT come to watch, and it's a great thing to be part of. Due to social distancing and change in visiting, this is now being taken away from patients, and there's been a lot of anxiety around this um, from patients who have finished treatment during COVID, because this is something they've looked forward to for so long during treatment, and now it's being taken away. So what we need to think about is how can we introduce this important aspect of their care how can we integrate them back into bell ringing again? Um, so they get that experience and they get that positive end to their treatment. So that's something that we need to work towards, work on, so we can make sure that we get that experience back for our patients. And I don't know how it's going to work and how we're going to get that back, um, but I'm certainly looking forward to watching more bell rings in the future. Palliative care. So options for palliative care have changed quite significantly. Um, in particular, that place of care where that child can be cared for um, and the availability of hospices. So hospices aren't being able to run as normal um, due to social distancing and guidance from Public Health England and the NHS. Um, palliative care normally offers quite a lot of support for patients and families before that end of life. So they offer sibling support, family support, offer activities that they can engage in together um, so that it's memory making for when that child dies that that family can carry for the rest of their life. And unfortunately, them services have been reduced, which is a real shame for our patients that are palliative at the moment. Communications changed massively. So we have lots of sensitive conversations with our patients that are palliative and social distancing has taken away that ability to 
comfort that, that family member in the way that we normally would. And the use of PPE has taken away that non-verbal communication and just the fact that they can see our face and, and have that effective communication with us. So that must be really challenging for not only the parents that are involved in that conversation, but also the healthcare professional that's trying to deliver that information to the family. Bereavement services have been impacted upon, so the bereavement team are currently working at home, so that must be having a great impact upon patients and families during this period. And funeral arrangements have changed massively. Um, for a funeral to go ahead, you need to have a negative COVID swab, and that's an added stress that a parent doesn't need when their child dies, that they need to have a swab in place before that funeral can progress on. Also, funerals have obviously changed because of social distancing, less people being able to attend. That's massively changed how you would plan a funeral for your child. And I know from personal experience, a child that I know um, who's died during COVID, her mum planned her funeral for 10 years. And for that 10 years, that mum had her funeral plans to a T, everything to the letter. And unfortunately, the whole funeral changed because of COVID. And that must be really distressing for that parent. And her moving forward after her child's death, how she's going to cope with that, that she didn't actually get what she wished for and what she plans for and what she wanted. So I know that healthcare professionals are working very, very hard to be flexible and offer as much as they possibly can to these families. However, it is going to have an impact upon them psychologically in the future. So what is the psychosocial impact? So fear and anxiety is being enormous. They're not only fearful about the child's cancer diagnosis and then they might lose their child to a disease, but they're now scared about a virus that they can't physically see. So it is making parents much more fearful, much more anxious, and children as well. We've had children that have expressed real fears that will ever come to hospital, I might get the virus. And what I've seen on the news is that I might die and I don't want to die of a virus. And that's things that children shouldn't really be thinking about. But COVID-19 is so out there and so exposed on social media and on the news. It's an extra fear and anxiety that they don't need during their treatment. Isolation is a massive thing, especially due to shielding. Um, we don't want our families to be isolated. We want them to mix with others. We want them to speak with others. Um, but unfortunately, that's not the case. Especially when you've got families that don't have a very good support network, and um, they might have, they might not have many other family members that they can lean on for support. And quite often, some families they lean upon healthcare professionals in the hospital environment to give them that support, and that's not available in the same way that it was. However, it is bringing some families together, and some families are really enjoying being at home and isolating together, spending more time together, and rebuilding connections that they they lost pre-COVID. The local impact, um, this is my experience working in Alderhey Children's Hospital. Our children's cancer and support group, um, Chicks, run by Eddie, does some fantastic work supporting patients and families on the ward and does social activities for patients and siblings and friends. He's noticed a massive difference with patients and families and how they're coping at home during COVID. Um, and certainly he's struggling to put support families in the same way. He's also may know that as a parent of a child of cancer, he would have really struggled going through his child's cancer diagnosis during this difficult time. He already found it stressful enough back when he was going through that with his son. However, now with the added stress of COVID, he would have really struggled with what that meant for him and his family. Robert Sefton, our youth support coordinator, who's funded by the Teenage Cancer Trust, works with our teenagers and young adults with cancer. And he's been doing some fantastic work to enable that, that peer support continues. Usually he'd do events outside the hospital where he'd take them out for meals, take them out for mini golf, go and see concerts and go to the cinema. But unfortunately, that's been taken away. So he's spoken to young people to see what do they want from him? What can they do together to support each other? And he's had some fantastic work done with the teenagers. Um, he's been doing online quizzes through Microsoft Teams. He's got a bonsai club, which miraculously took off, where the patients have all got bonsai trees. They're pruning them, sharing pictures of them, sharing advice. And he's been doing ukulele lessons, so the young people have been learning new skills. And it's been fantastic to see how them young people have engaged with all their activities and getting emails from Rob every week to see how well it's going. What's also been fascinating is that even new teenagers with cancer who are newly diagnosed, who have never met Rob before, are engaging in that service and managed to engage with young people that have been in the service a lot longer than them. So they've also been making new friends, which is fantastic. Click Sergeants is our social work department and they support our patients and families with cancer. And talking to Paula Dempsey, one of our Click Sergeant workers, 
Um, she's been having difficulties trying to engage with patients and families from home, in particular new patients who have never met her before and never spoken to her face to face. And she feels that when she's contacting these families, you know, to talk about how to access um, grants, how to access benefits, she almost feels as if she's cold calling and she's lost that rapport with the patients and families. Um, however, the service is still providing a service for these patients. She's still getting referrals, still managing to work with them. However, she has noticed an increased demands for financial support because um, parents aren't able to access work and get an income in the same way that they could pre-COVID. PIP, our place specialist, the way that she provides a place service has changed. Normally, she'd engage in group activities with the children um, and support them psychologically as well as through play. And she also does fantastic work with our patients who are going for radiotherapy and proton therapy to enable them to undertake that treatment without requiring a general anaesthetic. However, that's been put on hold due to COVID because you can't have that face-to-face -face contact. And we're already seeing a knock-on effect of that with more patients requiring a general anaesthetic for their radiotherapy and their proton therapy. Natalie Harmon, our clinical psychologist, has been working from home, supporting patients and families, and she's noticed different challenges around confidentiality. So if she's having a telephone consultation or a Microsoft Teams meeting with a patient or a family member, how confidential is that meeting? Normally within the hospital environment, it would be face to face in a closed room so they could be open and honest and have a frank conversation with Natalie. However, the dynamics of that has now changed. So we need to think of how can we make sure that's confidential for that child, young person or parent to be able to freely speak during their, their psychological appointment. Have you got any questions? Okay, I've got another one, um, Laura. Yeah. You talked about, um, you know, the psychosocial impact on the child. Yeah. Um, do you think it was different for the young people? Was there anything different, you know, for the teenagers and young people compared to the children? Yeah, I think teenagers and young people are quite technologically savvy. So they're still managing to engage with each other online through Teams, um, through social media, um, whereas young, younger children don't necessarily have that outlet and can communicate in the same way. So I think teenagers and young people have managed to engage a bit better and support each other better than younger children who you, you don't want, like I wouldn't want my nine-year-old boy to have access to the internet on a phone or on a laptop. So that he's restricted as to how we can contact other people and get that support. Um, so I feel as if the younger children have struggled a lot more and because they don't have that understanding, you can have a conversation with a teenager about COVID and what it means for them. And this is why you have to isolate. This is why you can't go to school. But for a four or five year old that doesn't understand why they can't go and see nan and granddad at the weekend, it's much more difficult to explain to them, get them to understand. And Absolutely. I think it is much more challenging for the younger children. Yeah. OK, thank you. OK. So I think the future impact of COVID-19 is going to be enormous. So certainly for our charities, they're receiving less income and less money. And this could be for a multitude of reasons, whether people are furloughed, the out of employment, who so can't donate anymore. And also charity events that are normally done in big crowds where there's lots of people engagement are unable, unable to take place due to social distancing. Less money into charities means that they're going to be less likely to support patients and families and also put less money into research. So is that going to impact upon future research, treatments and overall survival? With regards to research studies, a lot of research studies have been put on halt because of COVID as COVID-19 took over. Um, again, how is that going to impact upon the future? Is that going to impact upon um, trial drugs, um, drugs that we give in the future? Is it going to impact upon patient outcome and survival? New ways of working. So I think the new ways of working that we've developed have been actually really positive. So our virtual consultations, our online MDTs, um, I think that's really positive ways of working for the future. And I'll make a really good impact upon the NHS and save money and will reduce people traveling. The psychosocial impact, I think, is the greatest thing, um, not only now, but for the future. Yet we can see what the psychosocial impact is now, but what's going to happen in six months, 12 months, a few years down the line? How are we going to reintegrate our patients and families back into society when we've almost locked them away for five, six months? And now shielding is going to diminish. We're going to say from September they can go back to school. 
we're going to see that they can start socialising and social distancing is going to minimise when they've had many months of living in fear at home, isolating themselves. So I think there's a lot of work to be done to um, psychologically support these patients and families going forward, not only in the near future, but for many years to come as future waves of COVID come about. So the CCLG have been doing some fantastic work. So the SHARE study is to get thoughts and get opinions of patients and family members of how are they coping, what things have changed, so for them to share their views. And this is a very exciting project. Um, we're going to get to know the exact psychosocial impact upon our patients and their family members. And we can use this for future waves to see what is the best way to continue to support them and engage with them going forward. And I think that this is something that should be done across the board, not just for children with cancer, um, but also for other children with comorbidities, um, underlying conditions and chronic conditions. I think certainly this should be, will be beneficial to everybody. And then there's also um, another CCLG project that's running online. It's a free online programme to help children coping with lockdown and their parents and families. And it's a series of webinars. So there's six webinars that are to be watched sequentially from number one to number six. And it's a support mechanism to help them psychologically in the home environment and with regards to them coming into hospital for treatment as well. I've spoken to Dr. Bob Phillips um, from Leeds Hospital and York University, and he said that they've had lots of positives from this um, and really good positive feedback. However, they are going to audit it properly and there's going to be a complete write-up of the study. So it'll be fascinating to see what comes from this project. So take home messages for me is that COVID-19 hasn't had the original impact that we anticipated, which is fantastic news. Um, and it has created new ways of working. And I think going forward, a lot of these changes are going to be really positive. They're going to save the NHS quite a bit of money and save staff a lot of time. And it's also going to mean that patients can spend a lot more time at home and spend less time travel. However, it has posed significant psychosocial challenges for both our patients and our parents and families. And as I said earlier, it's how we get them patients and families back to a new, a new normal post COVID and what support we can put in place to support them in that, in, within that transition. However, it has opened up opportunities for research. So there will be a lot of research around COVID-19 and children with cancer. So it'll be exciting to see what the outcome is of that. And then I'd like to just say some thank yous to some members of the MDT that have supported me with this presentation um, and helped me throughout this time. Is there any more questions? Okay, thank you very much, Laura. I do okay. have um, another question for you here. Yeah. You talk about new ways of working. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you think that we perhaps need more nurses within the community um, to care for children in the home? rather than you know trying to support the the families a bit more yeah i think certainly that's something that we should should have in place um and i think other mdts working in the community as well i think we do need more psychology support um our youth coordinator i think would be great to do some work in the community as well um our play service i think everybody post covid and as we sit down and look back and reassess and audit the work that we've done I think it'll make lots of changes in the workplace and yeah. certainly a lot of members of staff are now working from home rather than working in the hospital so the hospital environment does seem a very different place because there's less footfall through the hospital and you see a lot less people they're still managing to work and function and do their jobs at home so why can't that be something that we we do in the future to minimize the risk of yeah. of an infection spreading around and also to reduce costs and and footfall through the organization but certainly I think keeping children at home as much as, as possible, as you know, is, is vital to them through their, yeah. through their treatment because we don't want them to be in hospital alone necessarily. So if we can put things into place to keep them at home, that'll be fantastic. In particular, your line flushes, yeah. any bolus chemotherapy we can give, supportive care. If parents feel comfortable and able to do that, then why can't they do that to save traveling an hour to come in for a procedure mm -hmm. that takes five, 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a good positive thing going forward. Yeah. So do you think maybe then that there'll be more knowledge and education needed for nurses to, to deliver this care in the community? Yeah, definitely. I think, as you know, the NMC standards are changing currently. Um, so our nurses that are going through the pre-registration programme are going to come out very yeah. differently to what they are now. But certainly we need to look at upskilling our current staff um, to provide care in a different way. And I think COVID's exposed that a lot, that actually when you work in a paediatric environment you do become very specialized like as an oncology nurse if you put me on a cardiac ward I wouldn't 
have the first clue on how to nurse a cardiac patient. So we need to make sure that our staff have transferable skills. So if this event happens again or if something similar happens, that actually we can work across the board and support each other and help each other and ensure that we can still provide a good quality of care for our patients. Definitely. Well, that's all the questions, Laura. Okay. So, thank um, you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Healy, and thank you, Dr. McAnally. Ladies and gentlemen, the session has now concluded. The next TSO session will take place on the 23rd of July, at the same time, and Dr. Vincenzo Valentini, of the Gemelli University Polyclinic, Rome, Italy, will discuss with Professor P. Francesco Franco, of the University of Turin School of Medicine, Turin, Italy, the following topic, the role of MRGRT in pelvic malignancies. Thank you for participating, and have a pleasant evening, day, or night. Goodbye.